You talk about the one room country school. I grew up in one of those one room country schools, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Uh, what you call it, thingamajigs, is a fairly new thing in my life um, as, a, as a category. I've been a collector of bottles and toys and World War II and Ames and Iowa State and whatever else gets in front of me sometimes. And then I start collecting these things that you look at this and you think, what the heck did they use that for? And so it ended up in my possession and then maybe I would figure out a little bit later what it was for. And so this became whatchamacallits and thingamajigs. And uh, these got our ancestors through some, um, um, well, most of these are 100 years old. Uh, a couple, some, couple of them are a couple hundred years old and uh, they go back in history quite a long time. And the uh, first thing I'd like to start out with is, uh, is uh, this right here. Now some of you <laughs> recognize that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What? Ice. 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 Uh, you tell the ice man whether you want a 25, 50, 75, or 100 pounds. And many times uh, I had a rental property in Eames that had an uh, uh, built-in ice boxes from a hallway in, the, in a kind of a closet area and the, and the ice man could come into the house and put the ice in the ice box without ever entering the house. So that kept people refrigerated back in the 20s probably in, the, in that area. <laughs> this is another, I would like to say that this is uh, gave the name ice cream cone to ice cream. This is an ice cream scoop and you turn it by hand, but it uh, did not get its name from this, from this. Ice cream cone came from either the World's Fair in St. Louis or somewhere at Coney Island. Both of them were given credit for somebody running out of ice cream cups and somebody else was, was selling uh, sandwiches and they wrapped up a little uh, kind of like a taco shell or, or something like that. They wrapped it up into a into a, a cone and filled it with ice cream and that's how the ice cream cone came about. That's what they tell me. And there are several different theories. Now this one is an ice scraper. 
and you fill it up and you flip it over and you have a nice mound of ice for your salad or something of that sort. A few years ago, we had a family together and I thought, uh, this thing still isn't coming through now, is it? Yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Doesn't sound right to me, but if it sounds right to you, that's great. We had a family gathering, and we had probably 25, 30 kids in this group, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if I'd get a big block of ice, and we would use this thing to scrape off ice and make snow cones. So I went out to the uh, uh, place out here and got some, I got some snow cone uh, syrup and a block of ice, and we took this thing to the family gathering and started scraping off ice. And by the time we got one of these full, I thought, wow, that's a lot of work for a snow cone. <laughs> and so that ended that very quickly. <laughs> but what do you think this one is? Ice cream sandwich. Ice cream sandwich maker. You fill that, fill that up and put that in between a couple of graham crackers or whatever kind of crackers you had, and it's an ice cream sandwich maker. About 100 years old with that one, too. Now, another one. Uh, a little bit of World War II, and, of course, you probably guessed that this is an ice cream freezer. But, it's a World War II ice cream freezer that doesn't have, it has wood and glass. The metal in it is only and the rings that go around the bucket. The, the, tent, the can and the paddle and everything is wood in here. And so it's, it's um, probably not your most efficient ice cream freezer. If you looked at the white knock freezers and everything today, but uh, it's, it's probably not the most efficient freezer because it takes a while. It only has one paddle, but all these pieces fit together and it's all a wood ice cream freezer from World War II. Uh, Dennis, I'm gonna finish up with that. Now I'm gonna go now I'm gonna go to the farm and then a few things here that that came here. I'll, I'll, I'll put these out of the way for Dennis. You can take those over there. Um, and some of the neat things from the farm are um, tools that one tool for the whole piece of equipment. And this one is a buggy wrench. And uh, I suppose there's some of you that could dispute that for me in here, if you lived back in those days. But a buggy wrench would fit everything that you needed to, to adjust on the buggy. And another one here, the, uh, the old wheel wrench for the, the, the multi-purpose tool here that was for the uh, uh, double tree and also to loosen up the wheel, wheel nuts to, to, to lubricate the wheels. And of course, these had right hand and left hand threads on them, so that the ones on the one side of the wagon would tighten up, and the right hand ones on the right side of the wagon would tighten up and as you were going forward. So uh, they had left hand threads on the left side of the wagon. And then the old, you know what that one's for? Some of you should recognize that. Maytag washing machine. The old Maytag washing machine. And of course, the Maytag company is now defunct, and it has been moved out of Newton. And uh, and uh, I was down at the store when they were uh, last couple of weeks when they were still still open, and uh, they were selling off the memorabilia and things out of the store. And it was kind of sad because that's been an Iowa icon for a hundred years, and uh, and it uh, I've got something else back here that I want to bring out about the Maytag. And I'll get it right over here. This has to do with, with Iowa State uh, women, uh, Home Economics Department, in the home, ec home Economics Division of Iowa State College, College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts, 1916. And they're doing uh, research on this Maytag washer. And this was called the multi-motor washer. This was after, after the hand crank washer. You could operate it with an electric motor or the old gas engine. How many of you had an experience with the old Maytag gas, gas motor? Any of you out there? Okay. They were a little hard to start, weren't they? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, I'm running every Monday. Yeah, okay, watch Davis Monday. How about that? Was that that's probably true all over the country, it seemed like. Watch watch Dad would have to start the start the motor and uh, we didn't have electricity then yet, and he would have to get it started and it was pretty hard to start and run a hose out this uh, hole through the the concrete block and uh, and once once it was started it ran until you finished the washing so if you shut it off it may not start again but this is the this is the first well not that this is not the first one but this is when they started to modernize it a little bit so uh, that's that's the main tag main tag washer now um, a couple things here oh here's another here's another multi tool for your cultivator International Harvester Cultivator. It's got the marking right on it, and that would probably fit about anything on the on the machine. Now, getting getting to a, a couple other things here. Well, one of them, this tool here, I think, could be patented today and probably sold. This is a, I call it a hoe rake, and it's got little little hoe blades, shovel blades on the end of it, and yet it's like a rake. And you know, when you're using the hoe, when you pull quite a bit of dirt with it. This would accomplish about the same effect, but it would leave a lot, lot better um, uh, smoothness on the soil behind it. So that's all hand wrought. Somebody thought that out, hand handed it out, and uh, made that, welded it onto a shaft here, and uh, that would probably a pretty good two of a day. Now I think some of you know what these are. Probably that's a bull leader. Put that in the nose, tighten it up. And, and lead him around. You thought you could lead him around. Um, this is also, this is a permanent bull leader. This is a bull ring. Now, if you can look at that, I don't know if you can pick up that point on there. But there's a point right there. And that had to go into the nose and then and punch it through. And I don't know who helped the bull when he did that. <laughs> but I'll bet you he went straight up in the air. <laughs> but once you, I've seen, seen them, seen them get, get mad enough, and talk about mad bull, where they rip these right out of their nose, too. They, they, they can jerk them and uh, get them, pull them right out of their nose. That's a pretty neat one right there. Now, another one here that almost um, could be like cruelty to animals now. Uh, is a little calf wiener. Now this came from the hardware store in Gladbrook. The old hardware store in Gladbrook is probably still there. They closed for several years and finally they opened it up and started selling off their old antique things out of it. And this little thing here is a thing that, that the pin pulls out and it again goes in the nose, tightens up on the little calf. Now, when the little calf comes up to Mama Cow a second time wanting something to drink, you know where Mama's going. She's going over the fence. <laughs> She's going out of the pasture. Because this thing is just totally, this, is, this would be cruelty to animals if it was out there today. It's pretty wicked. It's all cast iron, and uh, it's got uh, a bunch of points sticking out on it, and uh, it's a pretty, pretty mean looking thing. Okay. I'll let them put that back together for me. Uh, well, guess what we have here? A brick. A wood brick. Wood brick from Main Street Ames. Uh, taken out somewhere around 1926. And uh, the, when, they, when they tore up, the first Ames was in the mud. And the bricks dropped them out of the mud, but not probably very effectively. Uh, I mean, it was a lot better than getting in the mud because the water would run down through, but Ames was still pretty swampy. So when they paved, why well, they picked up all these old wood brick, and this one's amazing. It's, it's uh, survived because it probably had some creosote in there, and it's got end grain, so it would be good wearing. But um, this, the people just picked them up and took them home and made patios out of them. This happened to be in a garage on Brookbridge for how many years from their 20s, and uh, it survived very well. So um, uh, one of the neighbors told me about it and uh, that I would sure be interested in one of those. So this is a wood brick from Main Street 8, and, and it came out. There's some entries in the, in the, 
in uh, Ames, Tri Ames Tribune in the 20s, the late 20s, 26, 27, where they were taking up, I don't think they did this all at once, but they took up a few blocks at a time, and, uh, and then they would, they would uh, pave them. They were paving them. Another little device here patented in 1876. I didn't know what that one was for a while. And finally, uh, had some people over one night, and one of them was a veterinarian. And he said, well, I can tell you what that is. He said, that's that pig pole. Reach in there and get into the eye sockets of the little pig and pull it out, <laughs> assisting in the birth of a pig. And I can remember my dad going out to the barn in cold uh, winter mornings and, and helping with the with the birthing process because if you, if one of them didn't didn't come out, the rest of them they, they were gonna, they were all going to die. And so pulling and this did not harm the harm the little pig. I mean, it might have given them sore eyes for a couple of days, but it's better than the other alternative that's going to have to have to it. So it's got two different sizes for slipping in the eye sockets. And I suppose you could just reach in there and pop that in the eye sockets, and when you had a hold of it, you knew it and pull the little pig right out. No. 1876. We didn't think about everything today. There was a time in there somewhere where they were going to close the patent office because everything had been invented. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and now we're millions and millions of patents. Now, this is a picture from the Iowa State Bomb of 1896. Um, and uh, it shows the women's phys ed class. And, um, it shows him in two different poses with these, they call these barbells or they, did, they call them dumbbells or barbells and these are called Indian clubs. And, and you go to any antique throughout the, uh, shop throughout the country that has these and they have them identified. So they were, they were popular throughout the country and, and these, these, this women's program here has them in two different poses and so they probably have routines where they did with the clubs and one with the bells, barbells, and possibly even with both of them. I've been told also that Sears Roebuck sold these with a set of instructions to enhance certain parts of women's bodies that today might be called implants. <laughs> they would sell you an exercise program for these. So, Maybe we could pick that up if you're interested. This little guy found him in a garage sale in box home. I think a quarter, I think I paid a quarter for him. And uh, I looked at it, I looked like a cockroach, of course, and then I think a whole bunch of that would hold the broom. You know, that would fasten it on the wall, and the broom handle would go up in here, and the dustpan. And, uh, or maybe a dust rag would go on the outside of it. And uh, so I walk into the car, and I have that all figured out in my brain. And that's been about 20 years ago, folks. And, uh, and so I've been telling people for 20 years that that's what this was. Well, about a year ago, I was at watch here at the flea market. And I saw one of these in a display case. And usually when they put stuff in a display case, they've got a pretty good price on it. They don't want people picking it up. And he had a $200 price tag on it. I thought, what the heck is that? And I looked at it, and, and, and he called it, I asked him, and he said, it is a buggy whip holder. A buggy whip holder. <laughs> and uh, this thing would fit on the side of the buggy, and, and all you had to do is shove the buggy whip down in there, and, uh, and it would spring load and go right in, and if you wanted to stop along the way and do a little spooning with your girlfriend, you could just put the reins in there, and, or let the horses drive themselves, put the reins in there on this side, and it's perfect. And, and uh, another verification of that is there are initials here, J-I-C, which some of you farmers will know that's J.I. Case Company. And J.I. Case Company has changed their production a little bit through the years because now they're making combines of tractors and of course uh, from buggy whips and probably buggies way back then. And here it is, the old buggy whip holder. I took that down to an army store by Bloomfield, a harness shop. He, he makes harness of leather. And, uh, and he looked at it and 
he thought it was pretty neat. And he said, do you ever sell anything? <laughs> I said, well, not too often. You know? so I think he was kind of interested in it. But it, it, it's a pretty neat little buggy whip over. And it's got, the, it's got two different, there are three different castings, one back, one front, and the, and the, uh, the rain holder, and a spring. And then really, it's a, a really neat piece of work for casting. So, buggy whip. Buggy whip holder. Uh, that one's with that one. Uh, now, there's a little thumb that goes along with this. A little poem, I guess you'd call it. And how many of you have heard, Good night, sleep tight, and don't let the bed ducks bite? Let's see the hands. Everybody's here. Good night, sleep tight, and don't let the bed ducks bite. This little device took care of all that. <laughs> this little device tightened up the bed rope. And the bed rope was strung through the bed, back and forth, and when you would tighten it, then it would tighten up all over. You had to work it through, but this could be left underneath and stick these in the corner, stick this in the corner someplace, tighten it up if you wanted. You know, this, uh, uh, there, there's posturpedic mattresses. This is probably the original origination of that. <laughs> But this would be tightened up and left in there, and it would tighten up the bed ropes. And also, when they tightened up the bed ropes, you brought them up off the floor, and the bed bugs couldn't jump up and, and get in the mattress. And so, this is the one that made that possible that, that little home. Bed room tighter. Now, hang on to your ears. Makes a little noise, doesn't it? Dennis had some theories on that. What were they? Scare off the crows? <laughs> yeah, scare off the crows. That's one of them. Machine That's one of them that this may have been. I saw one of these in an antique shop in Illinois, and then saw another one someplace in South Carolina or someplace. And, and uh, scaring off the crows is one place this might have been used. Also, they said it was used, uh, possibly had been used for barge traffic uh, on the rivers in foggy, on foggy days when you didn't have, uh, or uh, maybe uh, where you, when you didn't have a steam, steam operated uh, engine. And, uh, and so you could warn other vessels that you were close by. One of the things I thought was a wake up call for a nunnery on the East Coast. <laughs> that, would, that would be rather, rather cruel. But another one, is that it was a, uh, a warning for gas in the trenches during World War I. And so when we were out uh, at West Point a couple of years ago, when I was taking played out there in the fall, played, played Army at West Point, we went through the museum. And lo and behold, one of these is in the museum. Warning device for gas in the trenches during World War I. And so once once you uh, sounded that, then the next people would hear it and pass it on and pass it on. And so uh, that's what it's supposed to be. And it's, uh, it's not anything real fancy, but it sure does. It scares, scares off the coast because we've used it out in our backyard too. <laughs> now, we have some ideas on that. It's like a nice little dipper. Part it's adjustable. I already have some in my ears, so I don't need this. This is a hearing aid, and it is very effective. It magnifies about. I took it into the Ames Hearing Aid Center, and we we said it's the original miracle here. So <laughs> it magnifies about eight times, and it's adjustable from sitting across the room. Put it in your ear, and it really before I got my hearing aids. Uh, I, I couldn't hear the birds, and uh, and put this thing in my ear, and they just they, they would come through very clear. So it really does the job, and uh, it's a hand it's it's all hand done with uh, uh, soldering and so forth. But they whoever did this was a terrific tinsmith, and they did a did a heck of a job on it. So uh, hearing aid. Now. Uh, I always like things that cross over to my medicine man. I do the medicine man show and I have toys and bottles. 
and I let things that cross over to the other things. And this is a kind of a little duck. Um, looks like a little duck. And it's a blown bottle about 100 years old. And um, found it, and it says, uh, Whitehall Tatum and Company, that's a pharmaceutical company, nasal douche, nasal douche. Well, you're supposed to put this stuff in there and take it off and let it, let it flow through your nostrils and, and, um, and kind of flows through and irrigates your, irrigates or irritates your sinuses, whatever, <laughs> whatever it might do. My sister came had one of these, uh, had something like that and that, uh, and it was a modern thing and, and I said, well, wait a minute. I went downstairs and got this out of my medicine man stuff and, and there it was. And, and uh, those doing the, doing the same thing, seven years old. Then I ran across this Rexall stuff called Lesperine. And um, it's supposed to be used with this. And it says, dissolve a heaping teaspoonful in a quart of water. Uh, and it is a vaginal douche. Uh -oh. But dissolve it as a rub, it may be used as a mouthwash and gargle. <laughs> It's all in the same sense. <laughs> they don't sell medicine like that today, folks. <laughs> That's what they're actually. I'm not sure if you can go up and find that up there anymore. <laughs> but uh, you might try it. You could go up and ask them for it. <laughs> um, another one that I had for a while and didn't know what it was, and then uh, this little device right here. And uh, I kept thinking it was something automotive to clean cylinders, but it wasn't heavy enough, and, and it just didn't seem to fit. And I took it to a bottle club meeting one day, and one of the ladies said, well, I can tell you what that is. She said, um, and I went, hey, we've got to show you a little demonstration. Like that. Oh. Look at that. You can clean the inside of that lamp chimney slicker than anything you ever saw. I don't know how many times my mother would get her hands inside there and, and it would break or something and, and she would that thing cleans the inside of that lamp chimney, it'll hold it all over the place. Uh, out at the uh, Harold Warps Museum, uh, they had one of these and they called it an egg beater. Oh. And, and it would not be a good egg beater because it's got too many places in there to catch food. And so uh, they could, that's what they called it out there. And the, one, the guy wasn't around there that I could straighten out. I don't think they would listen to me anyhow. But it's perfect for this job right here. Perfect for that. And of course, I'm sure a lot of you have cleaned those lamp chimneys from the inside. This is a particularly small one, which is hard to get into anyhow. But, but the old uh, lamp shade cleaner. And uh, somebody has done a trick. This is not a, oh, a really a manufactured one. It's uh, kind of a homemade. But uh, it's, it's a pretty neat little device. I'm going to set that lamp shade right up here. Where, I need my lamp, yeah, yeah, I need my lamp. And, uh, and this little lamp, um, got it. Uh, one thing you had to do is trim the wick. You had to trim the wick. Well, this little device here is kind of a, uh, at a wick trimmer that trims it at, a, at an angle, at a nice rounded angle that you want. You set it on, open it up, set it on there, and you tighten it down, and it isn't going to work like it's supposed to, probably. But lamp uh, wick is a little bit frayed out, but, and it's not sharp enough to really cut it anyhow. But anyhow, it's a, it's a pretty fancy wick trimmer. Probably has about three or four castings on it, and. Uh, and pretty, pretty nice little little device to, to use to trim the wick on these old kerosene lamps. Okay, yeah. Now, um, how many of you have graduated from Eames High School? Anybody out? Oh, where's it? Okay. Well, here is an Ames, piece of Ames High School memorabilia that was in the math department, and it was going to be thrown out. And they asked me if I was interested in this, and I said, you betcha I am. This was how many times you can dissect, how many pyramids you can dissect out of a cube, which I didn't care anything about that. I don't think I've used that in my life anyway. You don't know how many pyramids can you get out of a cube. But anyhow, what this has on it is signatures. And this has signatures back in the 30s and the 40s 
probably up into the 50s. There's some from 36 to 37. Fitz, there's Bud, there's uh, Bill Oak, uh, Brim, Flash Fraser, Jim Schaefer, uh, Bud Fraser. There, there's just there's hundreds of signatures on this on every facet of the pyramids, and uh, I have not. I think maybe the someday the museum will get this and they'll be able to write all those signatures down. But this is a composite of Ames High School math students that obviously didn't do much studying. But <laughs> they were spending their time writing their names on this thing and there's hundreds of signatures in there, all from Ames High School class. Go back to 36 and I think some of them get up into the 50s probably. But it's pretty neat, pretty neat time capsule. Okay. Now, another one here that uh, is a got a lot of history to it, and this is kind of a crossover to my gadgets and also the uh, medicine man thing. And what you got here, I'm not sure how well I'm going to be able to see that. Yeah, you can see that against my shirt. That little blade sticking out right there is sharp as a razor. That's sharp, that is very sharp. And it's a little knife, and this lever cocks back, and then it catches, and then when you want to trigger this, you pull this little trigger. And you would lay it over a blood vein. I don't have a cock right now, so I'm not, I don't. I'm, uh, you'd lay it over a blood vein, pull the trigger, and you would bleed. You, it's a bleeder. And um, this goes back. This one is probably this one. It's called in the, some of the old medicine books. It's called the Jeffersonian, back to the Jeffersonian area. And um, it's handmade. All the springs in it are hand wrought. The screws in it are hand wrought. Uh, everything is hand carved out, and um, got somebody's mark on the inside of it. Uh, and there's some marks in there of the person who made it or the person who owned it. Probably the person who made it. And uh, this thing all slides together. And this comes with an extra blade also. And the blade is spring loaded uh, with a with a, a heavy, you know, tempered spring. But what they would do uh, back in those days and clear up into Civil War time, even through the Civil War, they thought bleeding, uh, when you got sick, they would bleed you to get rid of some of that bad blood and you'd get better quicker. And uh, you'd, you'd get well quicker. Uh, one of the most famous bleeding people, people that have been bled in this, historical figures is George Washington. Uh, I never read this in the history books. And I, when I went to school, maybe I didn't study history that well. Since I've lived a little more, but I paid a little more attention to it. But George Washington rode out on his estates, reviewed his estates in a cold and damp fall day. And, uh, and he uh, came back and came down with what they call quinsy, what they call quinsy. And so immediately the caretakers bled him. And I think the way the historical books go, maybe about three times. And of course, they put in a call for the physician, but the physician was not on call. They were days away, a couple days, or it took a day to get there and, and to get back. And so by the time the physician got there, they bled him more. And George Washington just slowly started to fade away. Very lucid, conscious, and he didn't die from the disease. He probably died from bleeding being bled to death. And so, if you didn't read it in the history books, you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw that we had actually, in, in one of the uh, reenactment uh, scenes with the uh, military, they had a medical tent, and, and he verified all this stuff about George Washington and bleeding. So, uh, it's a pretty well-known fact. But it didn't get credit in, in the history books that I grew up with. So, but now when you bled, another thing, I forgot the rest of the story, the rest of the story, the bleeding. Doctors didn't like to bleed because it kind of messed up their offices. <laughs> and so the doctors would, uh, the barbers had a nice chair where you could lay back, lay your arm out, and they could bleed you. 
And they had a cup, they had a cup, about a four ounce cup. They beat it out and then they would stop and then and uh, they'd do four ounces at a time. And but it didn't say really how many times they would do it. But but what the what the doctors then would do, they'd lay you out there and they and they put this in your hand like they do today. You pump it and you pump the blood out. And this little gauze thing got bloody, got red, and pretty soon you had a red and white little uh, spiral thing that became the barber pole. And so the barber pole came from the practice of bleeding that the barber took over from the doctors. So uh, you heard it here too. <laughs> um, now I want to uh, reveal to you the biggest farce perpetrated upon the American public in modern times. <laughs> and that is, this bunny doesn't do anything. This bunny is a dumb bunny. <laughs> he can't move, he can't wait, swing his arms, he can't walk, he can't move his ears. Uh, when, they, when this thing started, the ads start coming on TV, I've got about a hundred battery art for your toys at home. I thought, I've got to have one of those Energizer buddies. So I called down to their headquarters uh, near St. Louis and said, uh, what do I need to do to get one of those battery operated buddies? Well, we're sorry because there is no battery operated buddy. All that uh, ad on TV is done with stop motion photography. They move the buddy, they take a picture. They move it, they take a picture. And so it's all done with stop motion photography. The waving of the arms and beating of the drum and everything. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, well, I had to have one anyhow. <laughs> I thought maybe I can get one of my other battery operated toys and, and energize it, you know, put a, put, a, put a motor in there or something. But it was a little bit too big a task. But my grandsons, they really took to this thing. And he'd take the, he'd take the, uh, the drum off, put it around his neck, and beat on it with these sticks. And they beat those sticks on everything. And pretty soon the sticks broke. So I called back to St. Louis and I said, well, I've got a problem. I need some more sticks. And what happened? Well, my grandkids were playing and they, they broke. Well, just send us some. How many do you need? <laughs> <laughs> so they were pretty magnanimous. But anyhow, this buddy just steps there. He just sits there. Uh, now, however, Duracell has a battery operated buddy. It just so happens that this guy is stripped to gear. His motor's running, but he doesn't do anything. <laughs> and I haven't had the time to take him apart and fix him, but he does play the drum. But in order to back up both of them, I have another one back here that he can really beat it up. And uh, he's playing snares and cymbals and drums and with his feet and with his hands. And um, he, he, he makes up for both of them. And he's doing it on an Energizer and a Duracell battery. <laughs> <laughs> so, we kind of got it all together on that one. <laughs> can, you get, can you get him up there? Yeah. Okay. He's a pretty active little buddy, and he does a good job of it. <laughs> now, um, I'd like to get into, oh yeah, I think, I think this guy, oh, I, mean, I got one more yet, that he's supposed to, he, he's supposed to join this crowd too. This is called Indian Joe. Homer Garts could have used him in the band. <laughs> <laughs> Indian Joe could really beat it up. If he was, if, if we were in a battle, I'd want him on my side. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to get into uh, another topic um, that has to do with cigars. 
Um, this is, a, I only brought about one collegiate uh, thing tonight. I've got about a hundred collegiate personality pets in my collection. This is kind of an unusual one. Uh, this is a one of a kind. It is one of their regular dogs that has a cigar in his mouth. And this was made specifically for Mr. Clutch Bill Scrooge. I don't know if you can pick that up there. Mr. Clutch Bill Scrooge, who was Al Knudsen, who was one of the early cigar smoking, card playing, uh, downtown, back behind the scenes, uh, decision makers in Ames. And, and uh, he was a tight wad, obviously. And uh, he uh, hung on to his dollars. And so for one of the Collegiate, uh, how many of you remember their their uh, sales bonanzas or their, uh, uh, yeah, some of you got to those. This is called the sales brawl. And from what I understand, that's kind of what they were, you know. People came in there and elbowed their way in. And uh, this this was made for Al Knudsen uh, for uh, one of their sales brawls because of his cigar smoking and so forth. And um, I had this, at, I was down at the senior center one day and I had this. And the lady sitting in the front row in a wheelchair said, that was my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything derogatory about it. But anyhow, uh, this is a special, special thing, one of a kind for collegiate. And uh, now, talking about cigars, and of course, a lot of those decisions were made in the smoke filled rooms and so forth. Uh, this guy here is kind of a world traveler because he's on a Trump. It's got stickers from Paris and London and all over the place. He's an exerciser. He's a smoker, big time smoker. Uh, this is probably one of his cigars right here. Um, I'm not going to light that one up. But, but anyhow, he's also he's an exerciser. And um, he's out spending time. He's smoking. I think his little cigar marker just fell off. And uh, he should be. Let's see. Yeah, he's going. He's starting to go to smoke out there now. Can you see any of that? Uh, starts to go smoke out of his nose when he stands up, which should be right about now. There it is. And uh, when he sits down, it's supposed to come out his mouth, but it kind of comes out his left eye. <laughs> I think he's been at it just a little bit. <laughs> One too many cigars. <laughs> but anyhow, this guy, he's a he's a pretty pretty interesting little character. And um, there he's really starting to warm up now. <laughs> now if you think about this this thing, um, what's happened, there's a tube there's a tube off of the inside. I probably ought to take this into Dr. Talbot or somebody at the clinic and see if they could do a little eye surgery on him without taking him apart. Because what I have to do is take the back of his head off and get in there and put that tube back on his on his uh, his uh, mouth. And uh, it's a little bit tough sometimes to do that. But when you look at this thing, he stands up, he sits down, he blows smoke out of his mouth, he blows it out of his nose, supposed to be. His cigar lights up, his arm comes up. Um, uh, his eyes blink. He's got a lot of action. And when you look for a bad art to enjoy, that's kind of what a lot of people want. There's a lot of action. And uh, this one has just about as many as you're going to get. And uh, uh, this is a brand new one. Uh, I found this on our last trip to Florida to visit Joe and Dee, who are out here right now. Joe and Dee Lindholm. And uh, I found this in the mint in the box, which is a uh, I don't usually like to buy them that way because they're more expensive, but, um, and I like to use them. I don't leave them in the box. I, have, I don't have any choice of them in the box. So anyhow, that's a, he's a fun guy. Now, speaking of cigars, uh, here is what, one of the things that they use to make cigars. And this is a mold, 20 cigars. Um, probably this one in the home industry. This might have been a commercial operation. Kind of small cigars, not very big, not for this one right here. But they made them in there, and then you press them and let them let them kind of form. This is an American-made uh, deal, and uh, the reason I'm giving it to cigars is because Ames 
had a cigar maker. Can you pick that one up? F. W. Egney, Ames, Iowa, cigars, and it's not a language that I could read, so I took this to a friend of mine, Arm Hill, and it says, "Smoke Norwegian cigars." Here you meet your friend, no bad cigar under this name. Guess what? It's written in Danish. <laughs> now, some of you Norwegians are going to have to fight that one out. I don't know how to interpret that one. But it's written in Danish, but it's the Norwegian cigar. So, right here in Ames Island, folks, we had it right here. When we were Traveling in uh, this one, I got I got this big bag. That's off of this bag of dry stuff. When we were traveling in England, Ireland, Scotland, um, the I, I call it a good thing, but my wife didn't call it a good thing. When we came upon an antique shop that took Mastercard, because we didn't want to spend our cash money on, on antiques, but if we could use the MasterCard, that was okay. I sent home boxes full of stuff. <laughs> and the, one of the things I found over there was this little device right here. Got a chicken on it. And any of you that traveled in Europe and had breakfast over there, you know that they served your egg in a cup. And you had to cut the top of the egg off. This is a nice little device to cut the top of the egg off. I'm not going to do this because it isn't, hasn't been cooked. So. <laughs> but it isn't raise any dumb kids. <laughs> uh, anyhow, this little device snips the top of the egg off. Rather a sophisticated little thing. And then, and then you just dip the egg out and, uh, and yeah, eat it with your spoon. So, uh, a little egg, egg cutter. Egg cutter. Egg spoon. And of course, that, that chicken on there gives it away. So. Now it's time for the program for a little, little story. Uh, and uh, that, I don't know where I heard this story, but I'm going to tell it to you. It's a little song, if you don't mind. That I might sing to you. <laughs> you had a Buick, a big yellow Buick. Boom, 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 that's the way it's supposed to go. And I had a little tin for <laughs> You used to guide me, na 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 na, as you passed right by me, your insults I ignored. Then you hit a mud hole, crash, a big sticky mud hole. Your engine just raced and roared, vroom, 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 vroom. And I pulled your Buick, oh. that big yellow Buick, at the tail of my little tin cord. <laughs> I don't know where that song came from, but I've asked friends and and cousins and brothers and sisters and nobody's heard it. So I, don't, I know I didn't make that up myself. Now, this little device, uh, someone who was at the beginning wanted me to tell them what this was. And I'd say they, I told them they were going to upstage me if I told it. This little device is a pretty handy little thing. Happened in 1897. And it's called a bunion stretcher. Oh. Remember, how many of you know Dick Trump? Dick Trump from Ames High School, way back. Okay, I see some hands. Dick Trump was a, a science teacher, and he also came from Cahoka, Missouri, and uh, worked in a shoe store down there. Well, one day, I saw one of these in an antique book uh, from a museum. I thought, Don, you've got to have one of those in your collection. I was over to Cola one day when they used to have flea markets over there. And I saw one of those on the table. Wow, just exactly what I wanted. And so I bought it. And walking along, and pretty soon I heard this voice. Hey, Don, what are you doing with that bunion stretcher? And it was Dick Trump. And he, he worked in the shoe store down at Cahoka. And he said, I used one of those things in that shoe store. And what they would do is they would, they would wet down the leather. And... Uh, 
they would put this thing in there, tighten it up, wrap a tong around here, and leave it set overnight, let it dry out, and then um, and uh, it wet it first, and then, then they let it dry out, and, uh, and it really creates room for your bunions or your toes or whatever you whatever you have, a bunion structure, and it really does work. Her friend, Elaine's friend, came from Colorado. They bought some shoes, and she had a problem with them. And I put this thing on there overnight, and it fixed them right up. So <laughs> it's still working. I'm working today. Now. Uh, this, this little device came from a house that was being bulldozed down near Bloomfield, Iowa. Um, and my son and we, I went out there and he crawled in and crawled through an opening and, and, uh, and found this thing, brought it out. Latimer Brothers Department Store, which the building is still in Bloomfield. It's not a department store anymore, but there's a, a, a stained glass sign above it, blocks and everything, that has that name on it. And I had that several years. And everybody guessed about picking cereal off the shelves and whatever. And, and finally, one day, we had the group over, um, and, and Phil Parsons, I don't know if you, you know Phil, but Phil said, well, you know, that would just about fit a bread pan. And we went over and got a bread pan. Look at that. And um, so reaching in, a push-pull, you could pull the oven grate out push it back in if you want to do, and then if the raised bread or the cooked bread, this thing would carry it right out and nicely take it away without burning any hands or anything. Because you always had to have a couple of pot holders on there to get that thing out of the oven and keep from getting burned. And there, there it is, right there, the old uh, bread pan holder. A neat little device and probably a giveaway at Christmas time. So, yeah. And then, uh, now, uh, uh, let's see where I'm here. I gotta do something right here. Uh, this is a little lesson that some of you might want to learn about what you leave laying around the house uh, that somebody else might get a hold of after you're gone. Found this in the antique shop in Tama. Nice calendar for the community grocery in Zion. Community grocery. Uh, grocery market. Which I think is on Duff Avenue, where the antique, where the uh, glass stained glass place is now. And, um, and I told, I thought, well, who was this person? Who was this person? And I went through the thing, and I had Secret Sis and Goldie Jones and Anna Jean Wilkes and Kay and Kathy and Ruth Hancock and Ida Taylor, and Mrs. Moss and Rose Elliott and myself. It was always myself. You know, and there are all these other people around. And she did, she played the Irish Sweet Stakes and, and uh, did, well, I don't know who she played, she just kept track of them. And, and she obviously went to Weight Watchers because she weighed herself sometimes three times a day. Um, and um, in the calendar, the first weight for the year was 219, January 6th. She was short and she was rather. Stocky, that's what they, people described her and uh, found, out, found out who she was. At the end of the year, I'm not going to tell you what she did at the end of the year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I saw, I saw on here Ada, Ada Throckmorton. Well, I know Adele Throckmorton. So I called Adele, and Adele said, Oh, yeah, that was my mother in there. And he said, I can tell you who that is. That was Opal Fisher. Opal Fisher. And she was. Um, Apparently very active because she had lots of friends, birthday parties, and everything else. And obviously, Weight Watchers was um, an activity, but maybe not a real serious activity. <laughs> <laughs> January 2:19, December 29th, 2:18. <laughs> 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 and this is a. This is a tremendous time capsule with all the things that are in there, all, all the people that are in there, and all the different things that, that she did and so forth. And it's a family history. So, John, what year is that? Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I think uh, this is in the 50s sometime here. Um, 58, 1958, yeah. But um, community grocery is over there on on Duck Avenue, where the state glass is right now. Uh, 
I'm going to bring a couple things up here, but this one right here is kind of a nice little uh, bottle. Banker's Life Company in Moyne, Iowa. Banker's Life Company. What the heck were they doing? Dispensing huh? okay. Dis dispensing medicine or what? Um, but this, well, Banker's Life, what did they sell? They sell life insurance, right? When the agent came out, how could he, what was the best thing he could take back from the person that wanted to buy life insurance to find out if they were healthy in your <laughs> And that's what these were for their salespeople. Uh, your example, Bob. I think it's been washed out. <laughs> that bottle is uh, the way it's made, it's over more than 100 years old. It's a blown bottle. And so uh, it's, it's been around for quite a long time. Now, this one right here we picked up on our way back from Tennessee, uh, from Florida. Uh, in, picked it up in Tennessee from the south hills of Tennessee, and when I picked that up, I thought, hmm, well, what that is? It's kind of a little swirly gay, kind of a fun thing. And first of all, you play with it, and then you start going, and pretty soon you have to watch the twirler because you start getting body language. You try to make that thing go, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, I wonder what that thing really was, but that looks like it was a pretty good deal there. Uh, well, I took it out to the uh, Lions Club on the Saturday morning. And um, and um, Dick McCoy said, "Well, I can tell you what that is." He said, "That is a fire starter or a drill." Uh -huh. You get that thing going, and you get good at it. You can get that thing really spinning, and then you can put it different chunks on the end, and you can drill holes with it. And that's what it, it goes way back into the early hillbilly days of Tennessee. And uh, of course, that cord on there has been around a while too, but this, everything on it is whittled, hand whittled out. So it's kind of a neat little uh, uh, hill country. Um, 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 I'm not sure what you call that down there, but it's, it's a neat piece. Okay. Um, another thing that we had in Iowa, we had the clamming industry. And Iowa was the clam, the button, um, capital of the world at one time with 49 button factories, 49 button factories. And I saw one of these in uh, a museum up in, uh, across from, uh, in Wisconsin. What's that over there? A very Sheen, I think. They have a museum over there. One of these clamshell holders. I thought, I've got to have one of those. <laughs> well, um, I went down to watch her one day and there laying on the table were five different sizes of clamshell holders. I now have them in my collection. <laughs> but anyhow, it's a, it's a little um, holder that has a groove in it, holds the clamshell while the person was standing at a, like a drill press with a cutter in it. And, and you could probably foot operate or hand operate the, the drive and it would come down through and cut, cut out button blanks. And many of those button blanks were probably cut out and sent to Japan for, for further processing and so forth. But Iowa was the button capital of the world because our streams had all that rhinestone going down and the clams would get into that rhinestone water and they would really grow well and produce some good shells that could be used for, for button making. And so, uh, and then of course, probably plastic. World War II had a lot to do with the end of that. And plastic also had a lot to do with the end of end of this this industry. But, uh, it was a big one at the time. Um, and uh, this this little knife, um, I saw that at a table of an antique show, and I thought I asked the guy what that was, and he said, "Well, that's an oyster shocking knife." And I said, "Well, how do you know?" He says, because I used that thing down in, down in New Orleans and on the Gulf Coast. He said, I shucked oysters and, and made and, and didn't get my work. And so you just reach in there and you've got a real sharp blade on it. Reach in there and cut, the, cut the, the muscle, open it up, and look what you got. <laughs> How about that? Got lucky on that one, didn't they? <laughs> a little, little pearl in there. Uh, another one I have here, kind of a neat little device. 
didn't take me long to figure out what this it is, because it says right on here. <laughs> Magic marmalade cutter. How about that? You clamp it on your counter, feed your orange in the back side, and back and forth, and it cut both ways. And you've got a real thin slice coming off of there. And of course, if you had any marmalade, you know that it has very thin slices of orange in it. And then, so it, it's a neat, neat little cutter. Marmalade slices. Well, that's kind of good. And I think probably that might bring me, that might bring me to this song. That is Tom. Let's see. It's about Nellie. That girl named Nellie. And Nellie went to a big neighborhood potluck. And Nellie had never seen so much food in her life. And so Nellie got kind of excited. She kind of overate. And then, oh yeah, she said, I gotta get something else over here. So we're here. Nellie ate some oysters, Nellie ate some clams, Nellie ate some Johnny cakes, Nellie ate some jam, Nellie ate some marmalade, Nellie drank some root beer. Nellie never knew what made her feel so queer. <laughs> and pretty soon, root came the oysters, root came the clams, Rip came the Johnny Cakes, Rip came the Jam, Rip came the Marmalade, Rip came the Root Beer. <laughs> now Nellie knew what made her feel so queer. <laughs> I don't know where that song came from either. <laughs> um, another thing we had here in Ames, um, that problem, oh here, I'm going to put this up first. Can you pick that up? Uh, this was Chautauqua Park, Ames, Iowa. And uh, I want to show you a map where Chautauqua Park was. But this is the shelter. That shelter eventually ended up being moved, uh, purchased by the school district and moved to what used to be Target Plaza on the north end. And it was closed in, the sites were closed in, and it was a field house. And so Ames Community Schools must have ended up with a portion, at least, of Chautauqua grounds. But now, I don't know whether that's going to show up now. This is a map of Ames in 1905. The railroad track coming through here, Main Street down here, and off to the west of the railroad tracks going out north, right there at that juncture where the Chicago, where the, where the tracks joined was Chautauqua Park right there, and Chautauqua Grounds. So it would have been right where, go west on 6th Street, as soon as you cross over the viaduct, you're in Chautauqua Grounds, and until you get to the river. So it went from the tracks on the south, North up the hill a ways, uh, I'm not sure how far up there. Are several places up there have Chautauqua on their abstracts. But then on the east side was the, was the railroad tracks, and on the west side was the river. So Chautauqua was, uh, had, a, had an established park here in Eames. And, um, and this was the shelter that was, that was on there. And, um, and that shelter then eventually was, was moved to uh, to the, to, to the, and Ames still, Ames School District still owns a piece of property down in that area. But here are a couple of Chautauqua uh, fans with programs from 1913 to 1914. And um, they had religious, um, musical, political, uh, educational, um, probably just some of it, just entertaining things. Uh, but uh, Chautauqua came from Chautauqua, New York, of course. Uh, that's where it started. But it spread throughout the country. And they had established Chautauqua grounds. And obviously, I'm not sure who owned the Chautauqua grounds in Ames, but Ames Community School District ended up with some of it. Of course, some of it is Brookside Park, East Brookside. And some of it has been sold for houses. So the Chautauqua grounds in Ames is, is split up about three different ways. But. Um, these uh, fans, nice little fans with uh, pictures on them, uh, but the, uh, 
uh, they ran for about a week and a half to talk to them. And, um, and they probably had traveling lecturers and people that would go with you talk to them from one place to the other. And it was quite an establishment throughout the country. But now, Chautauqua, um, this picture is of a, uh, uh, about a 1909 Ford. The boom went off the internet, and it's a spitting image of that. And this is probably at Chautauqua Grounds, because there probably wasn't any other park place to go to at that point in Ames. And if you can look at that picture, I'll bet you can tell who the proud owner of that car is. <laughs> Standing right out in front. And um, uh, there's also, I think, I don't know whether you can see it on this, but there's a, there's a tank sitting on the, on the running board out here. And at the beginning, I thought, what the heck is that tank out there? What was that? It was a carbon generator for their lights. And so they had a carbon generator out there, and then the tube going up to the, to the light. So they had, a, had their own uh, little system on there to generate, generate light. And they probably didn't have, they obviously didn't have electric starting on this one because they got the crank out in front. And that would have been about 10 years before electric starters came in. So um, that was a good heat car to have today, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Middle Model T. Okay, a couple more here. Um, this one right here, cave-in. Cave-in. What do you know about the cave-in? Campus town. It was a bar, right? Cave-in. How did he get its name? <laughs> well, some of you may know how it got its name, but I'm going to tell the rest of you. The cave-in was being built right next to our new, brand new fire station out there. It was built to house our 10-story ladder truck a big ladder truck. And um, and all those things were in, I'm going to move that down there out. All those trucks were in the uh, fire station. And the fire station was built so that the north and the south walls held of the fire station held the rafters and held the roof up. And the rafters hung off of the north and the south walls because they drove in and out the front. So they went those open. Um, they were building this building that the cave-in eventually was in. The cave-in hadn't been named yet because it didn't have its name yet. Uh, they were dig digging and excavating for the footings of the cave-in and they got down to the footings of the fire station and guess what they did? They kept digging. They went down about five feet beyond the fire station footings and not very far away at all and um, overnight the fire station caved in out of all the trucks. A total, absolute disaster if you were a construction company doing that job. I don't know how the liability ever spelled out of that, but the fire station came in on the trucks, and the trucks, our new ladder truck, had damage to its ladder, and, and of course we were out of service for the dormitories, you know. The ladder truck was purchased for those high-rise dorms, and so it was out of service for a while. But finally, I think probably everybody looked at it, and I took my students out the next day, and we looked at it, and just shook our head and said, you know, how could, how could anybody do that? And, and, and see those footings and keep digging down beyond them, you know, but, but uh, they did, and, uh, and the fire station came in, and the cave-in got its name, so it did have some outcome from it. The cave -in. <laughs> Actually, the cave-in is no more now. So, so that's a piece of history now. Now, in Ames, um, we had, what do you think those are associated with? Railroad, yeah, railroad. These are, these are the railroad links and pins. And this is the way railroad cars used to be connected together. They had a socket in the end of the car, and as the cars bumped together, uh, the, the link had to be fed into that socket. Well, they didn't have any automatic things in those days, so the, the brakeman had to be out there with a the hook lifting this up, and sometimes they got real brave and they just held their hand up and jerked it out of the rear wheel way real quick, and sometimes as the trains were coming together, uh, they would come a little too hard, and the brakeman would get knocked down and possibly run over and killed and maimed. A lot of them got maimed from this, but that railroad Lincoln pin had a direct connection to Ames because this 
pin was found right on the west edge of Ames along the tracks out in the sticking up out of the field, about like that. And uh, and uh, it's probably a hundred, you know, hundred years back. 1879, the Civil War, uh, uh, Confederate Civil War veteran invented the coupling that they're using today, or that type of coupling. He invented that, but it took a long time for the railroads to get to, you know, to get converted over. But Ames railroading was around since what 1860s or early 60s, some, somewhere like in there. And so that um, that railroad Lincoln pin was a very um, rough way of pulling them and hooking them together, but it did the job, and it was loose and lots of, lots of play between the cars and everything. But uh, the automatic coupler was probably a godsend for the railroaders. This is a railroad battery oil bottle, and the Pullman cars, each one of them had their own little generating system. They had generator, they had batteries, and the batteries were jars, and the jars were just full of acid, and then they had the plates down in there, and they'd pour um, oil on top of the battery to keep the acid from evaporating, and so the railroad battery oil bottles were just the right size for one, one cell of the battery. And so they'd, they'd fill those, and then when they'd get to a certain point, they'd throw them all out. They'd put them back in the box and throw them out. And they found about 40 of those in one spot out on the edge of Ames where the railroad would just dump stuff out as they went by. Um, railroad battery the box. Uh, <laughs> can you handle those, Dennis? Um, how are we doing at the time? Now, um, can you get any light over here or not? I'm not going to bring this. Uh, or Al, can you look at these or not? They may, they may not show up. These, these are all Ames Bottling Company bottles. Those are all from... Ames had a bottling company in 1980. And it was downtown. And, then, and Frank Danforth bought a Tipton Bottling Company and brought it to Ames and then had bottles made for Ames Bottling, Ames Bottling Works. And that's what this is right here, Ames Bottling Works, Ames, Iowa. And uh, this is from that era, about 1980. And um, um, one of the stories in the introduction to the uh, uh, Tipton, or to the uh, Ames Bottling Works was that girls were seen walking across Chautauqua grounds, tipping a soda, not of the temperance drinks that were sold in Boone. Boone was a bad place. Boone had whiskey and beer and lots of taverns, and Ames didn't have any of that stuff, supposedly. <laughs> they weren't supposed to have that stuff. Um, but they had the, the uh, soft drinks. And this was, in, with this one right here, whatever the cap they put on, that's what they had inside. Orange, strawberry, grape, whatever it might be. They mixed their own flavors and put their own carbonation. I talked to the lady whose grandfather bottled this stuff. She said he had a foot-operated carbonator. And so he would put the carbon in and with his foot. And if he got a little bit too much and then put a cap on it, pretty soon, and she said they had to take him to the hospital more than once to get him stitched back up again after a bottle blew up and blew up on, uh, in front of him or something or as he was capping it. But the bottling company was first located down on East End of Main Street and the bowling alley, and then it moved up to 13th Street. And right across the street north of McFarland Clinic, if you're ever in the clinic again, and you come out of there, all about the middle entrance there on the clinic parking lot. And across the road, there's a house over there that has some sculpted concrete block um, uh, used for the construction of it. Well, they, that's where the bottling box was. And then they made, and then he bottled in the basement and his wife made him kind of build a garage and move it out to the garage. So, uh, uh, and then they, they made these concrete blocks and, um, and built a couple houses in the neighborhood with those blocks that they made out in the backyard. So those blocks you see there were made right there by, by those people. But Ames Bottling Works, and then, and then the rest of this, uh, they folded up in about 1920 and uh, actually bought out by a company in Boone and then um, the person quit, I think he went to work for the post office. And then Ames Bottling Company, ABC, that some of you might remember, had all the rest of these products. Ames Bottling Company, they had Squirt, they had Dr. Pepper, they had Circle A. All these bottles have Ames on them, have Ames name on them. Uh, they had uh, ABC and uh, they had a lithiated soda. Uh, probably give you a little bit of a buzz, that stuff would. 
and then they had uh, anything that they had packaged in the green was a citrus product that they had to uh, they had to put it in a protective glass so it wouldn't go flat in the sunlight. He said if they, if they let that set out in the sunlight in a turbine, it would go flat just in one afternoon in the sunlight. Anything with citrus product. So now I gotta give you a. a I'm going to say a word. See how many of you recognize it. They seem a little strange in here. Shivery. <laughs> Shivery. We got some. Okay. We got some. Uh, well, um, I looked it up. I mean, I know. I kind of knew what they were. Um, a mock uh, serenade of discordant noises made with kettles, tin pans, and etc. And the etc. was an important part of uh, any shivery I went on. And I didn't realize at the time, because I was a kid, I thought, uh, they're going to, what they intend, I think, was to catch the young married couple in bed um, uh, just after they'd gone to bed at night and try to catch them later you know, on. I didn't think, didn't ever think about it, because you'd always wait until it was dark and then sneak up on them. And, and of course, you'd shivery and go around the house. <laughs> My dad made these. I was more disappointed. <laughs> and years and years ago, and every time we got to go to Shivery, you'd get those disc blades out, and they would probably be the star of the show because everybody would be beating on a five gallon bucket or something like that. You know? And these kids brought them out. They'd bring them out, and then you'd have, they'd have to keep, they'd have to give you a treat. And, uh, and sometimes that was a thing. You'd catch them, you know, that they, they didn't have anything in the house, you know, and so that was a little embarrassing. Shivery. Okay. Uh, some of you were wondering about this Iowa State. Iowa State dairy bottles. Um, they had a dairy for quite a few years. Ames had probably six dairies at least, right? Logsons, Davidson Banks, Iowa Guernsey, O'Neill's, Moore's, Iowa State. There's one I'm leaving out, I think. But they had lots of dairies. But the Iowa State dairy is best known for us, because when we came to town, you could get ice cream, you could get cheeses. You always got a box of cheese to send them, send to relatives, or to take to relatives or something. It was really, really some good stuff. The Iowa State um, dairy probably went the same direction as the WITV did. Somebody thought it was competing with with uh, local businesses, and and so it uh, it ceased production. But these are bottles left over from from that era, of course, and. Uh, and a, a half a pint, I think that's a pint there, and a half a pint maybe. But anyhow, um, those are pretty hard to come by, and quite a few people are after them. They like, they like them, and uh, they are, there's a lot of demand if you if if you have have to sell somebody. Um, I'll bring another thing from the past. Green yanders. <laughs> Oh, I've, been, I've done some programs at our house for ladies groups and I don't get the green ganders out real early because when I do the program's over. <laughs> <laughs> they all like to grow through. The green gander was kind of a racy magazine and um, with the different poses you see sometimes and also the stories in there and there was nobody that was safe from their uh, from their eyes when they started writing the Green Gander, so that was a that was a pretty neat, um, pretty neat little magazine. And the, um, you have one that was World War One, right? That was the Lavender, women. Lavender Goose. Oh, okay, Lavender Goose. And one year the women, the men were gone, and the women took over, and they called it the Lavender Goose. <laughs> and so, but that's only one year, right? Okay, yeah. And uh, I haven't seen those. So I'm going to keep an eye on you. <laughs> I got okay. Now a um, couple other things, and then I think I'm going to have to get this right here. I don't know what to do. It's kind of a, I'm a World War II collector, and this right here is an ink blotter from OC Hardware, Story City, Iowa. But it just so happens that my son is in the process of purchasing OC Hardware, and he was over there one day, and they. They indicated, uh, they said they found some stuff they were cleaning out and were going to throw it away. They said, no, oh, don't throw that away, you know. So this is an ink blotter, and it's a scorecard. 
and you can keep track of the Japanese ships there. They got all the names of the Japanese ships and plane, uh, ships and aircraft carriers, submarines, cruisers, battleships, aircraft carriers, and destroyers, and how many had already been sunk. And you got your own scorecard, and you could keep track of them yourself if you, uh, if you uh, kept track of the paper. So it's kind of a neat little World War II collectible. Um, some of you may remember collecting milkweed pods during that time and, and turning those in. And one of the guys, Bob Underhill, was over at our house one time talking to us about, about our civilian experiences during that time. And, and we said something about that milkweed pods. And he said, well, what, what did you do that for? So, well, they made life preservers out of them. Not for the pilots, because the pilots had what they called the May West because they had to inflate them because they didn't have room for them. But in the, on the ships, they had, the, you know, the, the, uh, probably, they were probably already, uh, already formed or something like that. The pilot needed space. Okay, folks, uh, I want you to know that the problems they're having at Iowa State, or the problems they've had out there with students and drinking, it isn't new. <laughs> this, this little flask, which probably, I would say, goes back to the 50s sometime, Iowa State College, on the back of it. When your heels hit hard and your head feels queer and your thoughts foam up like a froth on a beer, when your legs are weak and your voice is strong and you'll laugh like hell at some damn fool song, you're drunk, my guard, you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that was. That was so, well, it's Iowa State College is on there. So, uh, um, and uh, that's, that's, been, that's been a few years back. So uh, the problem has always been with us, and of course it probably will always be. A um, couple things I want to bring you out of the 197 bomb. I've got about 75% of the bombs that were published. And, um, and uh, some of them have some really neat stories. And this one just had a couple things in here. And um, one of them was something about uh, uh, everything at uh, Iowa Agricultural College. This is, these are excerpts from 1894. Uh, <coughs> with exception of new rules, making it grounds for immediate expulsion to be in Ames after seven o'clock in the evening or to be out of the building after the lights are out. I think that's getting pretty strict. Pretty strict. That's, what the, that's what the students are commenting about. And then, Iowa Agriculture College just received an acquisition to her student enrollment from South Dakota Agricultural, Agricultural College at Brookings. They had difficulty, and all but 40 out of 250 students left. Uh, that's in South Dakota. The senior class is coming to Iowa State this term. And so, I don't know, somebody is going to have to do that. That's a whole other research project to go out in South Dakota and find out what in the heck they were doing out there uh, that caused the, the people to leave. Well, now, uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to bring to you was uh, the dinky. The dinky. Um, here's the dinky. Yeah, that's good. There's the dinky setting in front of Mora Hall, probably 18, between 1895 and, and 1900. Uh, that came from a glass negative. And uh, so the dinky was, was fairly new at that time and uh, was running between Ames and the campus. And uh, here is referred a proposition to construct a horse car railway between Ames and the college. We do not believe a horse car railway will meet the demands for rapid transit. <laughs> <laughs> that was their, their response. We believe some means of rapid transit by electric or other railway would greatly benefit the college in various ways, and our failure to, re failure to recommend the railway proposition is not because of opposition to the plan proposed, but that with the hope that something better may be secured. And so that with that they they pursued building the dinky, and now um, and I have a token here for the Ames College Railway. If you want to take a ride someday, uh, this is good for one ride. So a token here, folks. Uh, I don't know what uh, you fit for that. I think maybe ten cents. 
what it cost you to ride the knee team. Um, but I'm going to, I need a prop. By the way, this rail is from the dinky, from the dinky track. Um, there was a corner post on my property when, when we built up there about nine years ago. And um, I was puzzled at, at to what it was used for, so I called the DOT and they said, well, you measure and tell me how many pounds per foot it is and I can give you an idea of what it was used for. And so I did that and, um, and it was way too heavy for the mines because the mines, they had to bend those tracks around uh, by hand in the mines and so they couldn't do it with that. It was way too light to be used on the narrow gauge or the railroads in Ames. They said the only thing it could have been used for was the dinky uh, in Ames, Iowa. So that's a sex of the rail. And here is a, a poem that I'm going to probably sign off with tonight, folks. Um, a genial professor bent above his bowl of breakfast food. His short half hour was nearly spent, but oh, that shredded wheat was good. He heard a whistle. <coughs> Rose half fed and took his napkin from his knees and folded it and sat and said, the motor. That's what they call the dinky. Then, excuse me, please. A lovesick student knelt before the beauteous lady of his choice. He pleaded as brave men before had pled with eye and hand and voice. He pleaded with such winning grace that long ere now those twain had wed, and not the black beast of the place. The motor whistled. <coughs> Romeo fled. <laughs> when earth and sky resolve in flames and darkness creeps across the sun, still facing down the track toward Ames, all ready for its long last run, we'll see the dime fed dinky stand and hear King Death forbid delay. While beckoning with a grisly hand, the motors whistle. <coughs> Come away. And that was the dinky folks. <laughs>
time. Well, I gotta get it on the right way. In Philadelphia, we lived right there on the corner of the back corner of Sawyer School, uh, right on the corner of Ross Road in North Dakota. That's where we lived. New Philadelphia was actually on our on our abstract. And so I got a plot map off of our abstract from New Philadelphia. And uh, this is not the one I got. You got this out of the atlas, right? Yeah. Yeah. And New Philadelphia was platted about 1858 or 59, anticipating that the railroad was coming through and that he was going to start a town. Cynthia Duff had other ideas. And she was going to go to it, the railroad people, and they sold property to them. And pretty soon, the rail and, and in my abstract, there are, from, from Ross Road out there, there are uh, entries where lots were sold and, and, uh, and through the years, and you know, for just a few years there, they were sold, and pretty soon in the early 1860s, a railroad came through, and it didn't come through New Philadelphia. It came from the north. And so Ontario sprung up, and you can see the close proximity. And the plat map, early plat map I have in New Philadelphia is just these squares right here, and right here. The Ontario Cemetery is right over that area, so it kind of wraps around that. Now, the, well, and then of course shortly after that, people quit paying their taxes on their lots, and so the lots, they started foreclosing on them. And that foreclosures on my abstract was going on uh, clear 1920, and up in there that was still foreclosing on lots. And when Hunziker's and those, some others got ready to develop out in there, uh, the city of Ames finally abandoned the plat of New Philadelphia uh, back in the 19, like in about 1960s, so they could clear it off and get ready to, to build out there. There are about 26 hits in city council minutes on New Philadelphia itself. But one thing I wanted to leave you with tonight, a significant remnant of New Philadelphia is this little spot right here. It's not marked on this map, but on my other one, it's marked as the, as the, the, the uh, town square. And it's unsold here. It isn't marked out as it is circuit. It's unsold. And that town square, if you've ever been up in North Dakota, is that big old water tower sits right on the town square in New Philadelphia. And it makes sense that it wasn't sold and the city was able to get a hold of all that without purchasing it purchasing a bunch of different pieces for people. So, anyhow, New Philadelphia, Ames, Iowa. It was here before Ontario. It was here after Ames, but it was in the early days. And uh, and uh, John Vess, I think, was the guy that tried to drop that. So, okay, thank you. He said if they, if they let that set out in the sunlight in the third bottle, it would go flat just in one afternoon in the sunlight. Anything that's about that. Well, now, I've got to give you a, a, I'm going to say a word. See how many of you recognize it. It may seem a little strange thing here. Shivery. <laughs> Shivery, we got some, okay. We got some, uh, well, um, I looked it up. I mean, I know I kind of knew what they were. Um, a mock uh, serenade of discordant noises made with kettles, tin pans, and etc. And the etc. was the important part. Uh, any shivery I went on, and I didn't realize it at the time because I was a kid. I thought uh, they're going to. The intent, I think, was to catch the young married couple in bed. Um, uh, just after they'd gone to bed at night and try to catch them, you know, and I didn't think, didn't ever think about it because you'd always wait until it was dark and then sneak up on them. And, and of course, you'd shiver in, go around the house. <laughs> My dad made these. I was more disappointed. <laughs> and years and years ago, and every time we got to go to Shivery, you'd get those disc blades out, and they would probably be the star of the show because everybody would be beating on a five-gallon bucket or something like that. <laughs> and these kids brought them out. They'd bring them out, and then you'd have, they'd have to keep, they'd have to give you a treat. And, uh, and sometimes that was a thing. You'd catch them, you know, that they, they didn't have anything in the house, you know, and so that was a little embarrassing. Shivery. Okay. Uh, some of you were wondering about this Irish state. Iowa State Dairy Bottles. Um, 
they had a dairy for quite a few years. Ames had probably six dairies at least, right? Logsons, Davidson Banks, Iowa Guernsey, O'Neill's, Moore's, Iowa State. There's one I'm leaving out, I think. But they had lots of dairies. But the Iowa State dairy is best known for us because when we came to town, you could get ice cream, you could get cheeses. You always got a box of cheese to send them send to relatives or to take to relatives or something that was really, really some good stuff. The Iowa State um, dairy probably went the same direction as the WITV did. Somebody thought it was competing with, with uh, local businesses and, and so it, uh, it ceased production. But these are bottles left over from, from that era, of course, and a, and a, a half a pint, I think that's a pint there, and a half a pint maybe. But anyhow, um, those are pretty hard to come by, and quite a few people are after them. So they, like, they like them, and uh, they are, there's a lot of demand if you if if you have happen to sell somebody. Um, I bring another thing from the past. Green yanders. <laughs> I've, I've done some programs at our house for ladies groups. And I don't get the green ganders out real early because when I do, the program's over. <laughs> <laughs> they all like to go through. The green gander was kind of a racy magazine and um, with the different poses you see sometimes and also the stories in there. And there was nobody that was safe from their, uh, from their eyes when they started writing, the green gander. So that was a, that was a pretty, neat, uh, pretty neat little magazine. And, um, you have one that was World War One, right? That was the lavender, women. Lavender Goose. Oh, okay, Lavender Goose. And one year the women, the men were gone, and the women took over, and they called it the Lavender Goose. <laughs> and so, but that's only one year, right? Okay, good. And uh, I haven't seen those, so I'm going to keep an eye on you. <laughs> I got okay. Now, a um, couple other things, and then I think I'm going to have to get this right here. I don't know what to do. It's kind of a, I'm a World War II collector, and this right here is an ink blotter from OC Hardware, Story City, Iowa. But it just so happens that my son is in the process of purchasing OC Hardware. And he was over there one day, and they, they indicated, uh, they said they found some stuff they were cleaning out and were going to throw it away. And he said, no, oh, don't throw that away, you know. So this is an ink blotter, and it's a scorecard. And you can keep track of the Japanese ships there. They got all the names of the Japanese ships and planes, or ships and aircraft carriers, submarines, cruisers, battleships, aircraft carriers, and destroyers, and how many had already been sunk. And you got your own scorecard, and you could keep track of them yourself if you, uh, if you uh, kept track of the paper. So it's kind of a neat little World War II collectible. Um, some of you may remember collecting milkweed pods during that time. And, and turning those in, and one of the guys, Bob Underhill, was over at our house one time talking to us about about our civilian experiences during that time, and, and we said something about that milkweed pods, and he said, well, what, what did you do that for? He said, well, they made life preservers out of them. Not for the pilots, because the pilots had what they called the May West, because they had to inflate them, because they didn't have room for them, but in the, on the ships, they had, the, you know, the, air, the uh, probably, they were probably, Already, uh, already formed or something like that. It's finally needed space. Okay, folks, um, I want you to know that the problems they're having at Iowa State, or the problems they've had out there with students and drinking, is, isn't new. <laughs> this, this little flask, which probably, I would say, goes back to the 50s sometime, Iowa State College, on the back of it. When your heels hit hard and your head feels queer and your thoughts foam up like a froth on a beer, when your legs are weak and your voice is strong and you'll laugh like hell at some damn fool song, you're drunk, my guard, you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was so well. It's Iowa State College is on there, so uh, um, and uh, that's that's been that's been a few years back, so. Uh, the problem has always been with us, and of course it probably will always be. A um, couple things I want to bring in out of the 19, 
seven bonds. I've got about 75% of the bonds that were published, and, um, and uh, some of them have some really neat stories. And this one just had a couple things in here. And, um, one of them was something about uh, uh, everything that uh, Iowa Agricultural College. This is, these are excerpts from 1894. Um, <coughs> with exception new rules, making it grounds for immediate expulsion to be in Ames after 7 o'clock in the evening, or to be out of the building after the lights are out. I think that's getting pretty strict. Pretty strict. That's, what the, that's what the students commenting about. And then, Iowa Agriculture College just received an acquisition to her student enrollment from South Dakota Agricultural, Agricultural College at Brookings. They had difficulty, and all but 40 out of 250 students left. Uh, that's in South Dakota. The senior class is coming to Iowa State this term. And so, I don't know, somebody is going to have to do that. That's a whole other research project to go out in South Dakota and find out what in the heck they were doing out there uh, that caused the, the people to leave. Well, now, uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to bring to you was uh, the dinky. The dinky. Uh, here's the dinky. Oh. Yeah, that's good. There's the dinky setting in front of Mora Hall, probably 18, between 1895 and, and 1900. Uh, that came from a glass negative. And um, so the dinky was, was fairly new at that time and uh, was running between Ames and the campus. And uh, here is referred a proposition to construct a horse car railway between Ames and the college. We do not believe a horse car railway will meet the demands for rapid transit. <laughs> <laughs> that was their, their response. We believe some means of rapid transit by electric or other railway would greatly benefit the college in various ways, and our failure to, re failure to recommend the railway proposition is not because of opposition to the plan proposed, but that with the hope that something better may be secured. And so that with that they they pursued building the dinky, and now um, and I have a token here for the Ames College Railway. If you want to take a ride someday, uh, this is good for one ride. So token here, folks. Uh, I don't know what uh, you fit for that. I think maybe ten cents. That's what it costs you to ride the dinky. Um, but I'm gonna. I, I need a prop. By the way, this rail is from the Dinky, from the Dinky track. Um, there was a corner post on my property when, when we built up there about nine years ago. And um, I was puzzled at, at what it was used for, so I called the DOT, and they said, well, you measure and tell me how many pounds per foot it is, and I can give you an idea of what it was used for. And so I did that, and, um, and it was way too heavy for the mines, because the mines, they had to bend those tracks around uh, by hand in the mines, and so they couldn't do it with that. It was way too light to be used on the narrow gauge or the railroads in Ames. They said the only thing it could have been used for was the dinky uh, in Ames, Iowa. So that's a sex of the rail. And here is a, a poem that I'm going to probably sign off with tonight, folks. Um, a genial professor bent above his bowl of breakfast food, his short half hour was nearly spent, but oh, that shredded wheat was good. He heard a whistle, <coughs> rose half fed, and took his napkin from his knees and folded it and sat and said, the motor, that's what they call the dinky. Then, excuse me, please. A lovesick student knelt before the beauteous lady of his choice, he pleaded as brave men before had pled with eye, hand, and voice. He pleaded with such winning grace that long ere now those twain had wed had not the black beast of the place. The motor whistled. <coughs> Romeo fled. 
When earth and sky dissolve in flames and darkness creeps across the sun, still facing down the track toward Ames, all ready for its long last run, we'll see the dime fed dinky stand and hear King Death forbid delay. While beckoning with a grisly hand, the motors whistle. <coughs> Come away. And that was the dinky, folks. <laughs> here about 30 years ago. Prince Faisal, I think, from Saudi Arabia, he had a conference out at uh, Sheman. What was that about? Icebergs. Huh? Icebergs. Iceberg. Well, look at there. That's from the iceberg. It's been in our freezer all those years. <laughs> And my wife tried to destroy it one time when she defrosted the freezer and forgot to take it out, but it's it survived. And so this is the, the chunk of the iceberg. If anyone wants to do some, got a microscope and want to take a look at it and see what's in there. So this is a chunk of that iceberg. When they finished the conference, they carried it out to the sidewalk and kind of broke it up in chunks and told people to come and get it. And it announced on the radio and. Uh, and he was trying to tow an iceberg to the, those arid countries and, and pull it into a, a closed area and melt it down and use it, use it for, for drinking water. So um, that's part of that's it. And, yeah, I'm not sure whether that's going to make it back in the freezer or not. I have to get that by my, my, con, my home consultant first. <laughs> well, so, uh, it's been kind of fun. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've been a collector of aims for uh, quite a few years, and uh, Dennis has been out to my house and kind of drooled over some of my <laughs> some of the things I have, and uh, it'll probably end up in the museum someday, <laughs> Dennis, if you get some space for it. So. But um, I think I probably better close it off here. And uh, what did you did uh, you know? Anybody know anything about New Philadelphia? Any heads out there? So, okay, so, yeah, there are some people that know about it. Well, this is New Philadelphia. Uh, whoop, i got to get it on the right way. New Philadelphia. We lived right there on the corner of the back corner of Sawyer School, uh, right on the corner of Ross Road in North Dakota. That's where we lived. New Philadelphia was actually on our, on our abstract. And so I got a plot map off of our abstract from New Philadelphia. And uh, this is not the one I got. You got this out of the atlas, right? Yeah. yeah. And New Philadelphia was platted about 1858 or 59, anticipating that the railroad was coming through. And he was going to start a town. Cynthia Duff had other ideas. And she was going to go to it, the railroad people, and they sold property to them, and pretty soon, the rail, and, and in my abstract, there are, from, from Ross Road out there, there are uh, entries where lots were sold and, and, uh, and through the years, and you know, for just a few years there, they were sold, and pretty soon in the early 1860s, the railroad came through, and it didn't come through New Philadelphia. It came from the north. And so Ontario sprung up, and you can see the close proximity. And the plat map, early plat map I have in New Philadelphia is just these squares right here, right here. The Ontario Cemetery is right over there, right? so it kind of wraps around that. Now, the well, and then of course, shortly after that, people quit paying their taxes on their lots, and so the lots they started foreclosing on them. And that foreclosures on my abstract was going on uh, clear 1920 and up in there that was still foreclosing on lots. And when Hunziker's and those, some others got ready to develop out in there, uh, the city of Ames finally abandoned the plat of New Philadelphia uh, back in the, like in about 1960s, so they could clear it off and get ready to, to build out there. There are about 26 hits in city council minutes on New Philadelphia itself. But 
And one thing I wanted to leave you with today, a significant remnant of New Philadelphia is this little spot right here. It's not marked on this map, but on my other one, it's marked as the, as the, the, the uh, town square. And it's unsold here. It isn't marked out as it inserted. It's unsold. And that town square, if you've ever been up in North Dakota, is that big old water tower sits right on the town square in Philadelphia. And it makes sense that it wasn't sold and the city was able to get a hold of all that without purchasing a bunch of different pieces for people. So, anyhow, New Philadelphia. Ames, Iowa. It was here before Ontario. It was here after Ames, but it was in the early days. And uh, and uh, John Vess, I think, was the guy that tried to drop that. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you.